Hello. You are listening to the Grieving Parents Sharing Hope podcast. We are here to walk with parents on their unwanted journey of child loss, guiding them to a place of hope, light, and purpose, not in spite of their child's death, but as a way to honor his or her life. And now, here is your host, author, speaker, and bereaved parent, Laura Deal. Hi. Today's episode is being sponsored by Jeff and Mary Beth Patnode in honor of their son, Michael Patnode. Michael was a very caring young man who loved his family dearly and was baptized at age nine. He loved to learn and was a senior in biology with nearly a 4.0 GPA when he passed away suddenly on December 12, 2023. He is the second of five boys He will be dearly missed by his brothers, parents, grandparents, and many aunts, uncles, and cousins. He loved nature, especially the beach. He was a talented musician who played lead trumpet in his high school marching band. He also loved computer games and Dungeons and Dragons. He had a large network of friends online, at school, and in his hometown. He will be forever remembered and loved until we meet again in eternity. Thank you, Jeff and Mary Beth, for sponsoring today's episode in memory of your son, Michael. Today we are going to talk about comparisons. Not when someone who's not lost a child tries to compare their loss to ours, but how we can tend to compare ourselves with each other in areas like our timeline of grief or how we're responding to our loss compared to others we talk to or hear about. This can be consciously intentional thoughts we spend time thinking about or subconsciously. So let's start with this. I hear from parents who desperately want to see their child in a dream. Sometimes other family members will have dreams about their child and then tell the parent about those dreams, which gets them even more upset. It's like, I'm the mom. I loved her more than anyone. Why aren't I seeing her? Why don't I get to have that and have dreams? Some get frustrated when they find out another perever had a dream about their own child because they so desperately want to see their own child also. Why do they get to have a dream about their child, but I don't have a dream about mine? Now, this whole thing about dreams, I did do a podcast episode on that. I talked to someone who kind of specializes in dreams and not the woo-woo stuff, okay? And I will look that episode up. I didn't think about it until just now, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you want to listen to that. It's really good. But there are other things we might get frustrated about too. There are perivers who get angry because their child died suddenly, unlike those who knew their child was dying and they got to say goodbye. Other parents had to watch in horror and agony for weeks while their child slowly slipped away, getting weaker and weaker, and finally struggling even to be able to breathe. And they're angry about how their child had to suffer like that, along with having those traumatic haunting memories, and would rather have had a sudden loss. Actually, not at all, right? But I think you know what I'm saying. How about... Why did you get 29 years with your daughter and I only got to have seven years with mine? At least you got to watch her grow up and know what she was like as an adult for a few years. I didn't get to have that. Now, someone may not say that, but like I said, sometimes these are thoughts that we think. But here on the other hand, yes, I had the blessing of seeing my daughter as an adult. I also got to know what it was like to turn the corner from a rough childhood with a very strong-willed child very rocky teen years, to having my daughter become one of my very best friends and then having that ripped away from me. I may know what the pain of that is like, but I don't know what it's like to lose an infant and to have your breast milk still coming in fully and be in not just emotional pain, but actual physical pain and having an ache in your arms physically because there's no baby to hold close and in having the overflow of milk because there's no baby to feed. I could continue with more of these kinds of things, wanting to know why we didn't get to have it like someone else did with their child, but I'm pretty sure you're getting the idea here. This may sound strange, but I want to take a look at Jacob in the Bible. He thought his son Joseph had been killed by wild animals, not knowing that his other sons who were jealous of Joseph sold him off as a slave to travelers who lived in a totally different country in Egypt. 
Many years later, a famine hit and Jacob's family was affected by it. And they heard there was plenty of grain stored up in Egypt. And eventually the brothers all caravaned together to go buy some of that grain to take home to their families so they would not all die of starvation. There's a lot to the story I won't go into. You're probably familiar with it. But the bottom line is that by then, their brother Joseph, with God's favor, was now second in command to Egypt's Pharaoh. That means Joseph was the second most powerful man in the world at that time. That's crazy to think about, isn't it? And when his brothers came for the grain, he recognized them. But of course, there's no way they recognized him. So after Joseph revealed who he was to his brothers, he sent them to get his father and have them all move to Egypt where he could take care of them until the famine was over. When they returned home and they told Jacob that his son Joseph was still alive, he didn't believe them at first. And when he finally did believe them, the Bible says that Jacob's spirit was revived and he was excited that he would be able to go and see Joseph. Kind of makes me think about when King David said in 2 Samuel 12, 23, that his infant son who died would not come back to David, but David would go to his son. That's like us, right? Our children aren't going to come back to us, but we are going to go to them. Now, you may be thinking, I wish my child wasn't really dead. Why didn't I get that? <laughs> We're back to that, right? We also think things like, why didn't I get the testimony that my child was healed or that my child was spared in an accident? Let me just say that comparisons don't help at all. God is doing something different in each person's life. And I believe that in the lives of those of us who've lost a child from this earth, he is doing a very deep work. Now, Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold as an Egyptian slave. So his dad thought he was gone at age 17, forever 17, right? Based on the timeline given, Joseph was probably about 41 years old when the brothers found out he was alive and who he was, and they went back to get their dad, Jacob, to take him to Egypt. And that means that Jacob thought his son was dead for about 24 years before he found out that was not true and was able to see and hug his son again. Now, some of us, we're going to have to wait a lot longer than 24 years to see and hug our child again. Barbara Bush, President Bush's wife, was 28 when her three-year-old daughter, Robin, well, it was their, their daughter, Robin, died in her arms of leukemia. I don't know if you knew that or not. Barbara did not get to be reunited with her daughter for 65 years. Some of us are not even going to have to wait 10 years. But once again, comparisons, they're just not helpful. There just aren't going to be answers to most of these questions on this side of heaven. But I feel like there's still questions we need to ask because we have to hammer them out until we get to the point where we're exhausted asking and we resign ourselves to not knowing and just kind of surrender to that and be okay with not knowing, which is going to allow us to move past these comparisons and these questions that we have. Many Christians have been taught that God has a wonderful plan for their lives. And we think that means our life is going to be great. It's full of fun, laughter, sunshine. Nothing bad is ever going to happen to us. But that's man's interpretation. And we did talk about that some last week about God's plan for us for a hope and a future when we looked at Jeremiah 29, 11. Jesus warned us that we will have hard times but he also promised that he would be with us to help us through them. He said, those who mourn will be comforted. He didn't say that we'll never mourn. He said, we'll always have the poor with us. He didn't end poverty at that time. These are the kinds of things the Holy Spirit will use the most to actually draw us closer to himself and to have the opportunity to know him more intimately than we ever knew was even possible. And that's something I talked about recently too when I did that episode on communion. And he will bring us to a place of being victorious if we let him. God's 
love for us, for you, for me, is the one stable thing that we can count on in the life that we're living here on this earth. Not only does he love you, but he is right smack dab in the middle of your grief with you. And he is excited about you knowing your future and the good things he still has for you. He is the foundation we have built our lives on. Most foundations of a building are unable to be seen, right? That doesn't mean it's not there. A building might fall. Something might happen to it. But the foundation remains and our lives may have fallen apart, but the foundation of Christ is still there. We may not believe it. We may not be able to see it or feel it, but he is still there, firm and steady. And if you're not there yet, it's okay. You may still be fresh in your grief, which can be up to five years. These may sound like empty words to you, but keep hanging in there one day, one breath, one tear at a time while doing what you can not to torment yourself with how another perever got something with their child that you didn't get. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, all they are doing, of course, is to measure themselves by their own standards or by comparisons within their own circle. And that doesn't make for accurate estimation, you may be sure. That's the Phillips translation. I tell those who ask how to help someone who's lost a child, don't ever start a sentence with the word at least. Just don't bother saying it because it will hurt more than it will help. And I know a lot of you have heard those. At least you still have other children. At least you know where your child is. Those kinds of things. And while it's extremely rare for a perever, and that is a parent who's been bereaved of their child, perever, parent bereaved of their child, it's rare for a perever to tell another perever, I know how you feel because I lost my child too. In our minds, we may tend to compare parts of our loss with others, but we really don't, I've hardly ever, ever, ever heard one parent tell another, I know how you feel because I lost my child too, even if we lost our children in the same way. And just like I, I said that I suggest to people not to tell a parent who's lost a child at least, don't start anything with the words at least, I want to make the same suggestion to you. If your thought starts with the words, at least they, at least they got to, at least they didn't have to, at least they, then dismiss it from your mind immediately, knowing there are probably perivers around you who have some at least thoughts about your loss. These things keep us in a place of bitterness and turmoil, which you know is not a good place to be. So ask the Holy Spirit to call attention to when you think these thoughts so you can begin to get rid of them. I want to remind you that death is not the end. Sometimes we can see it as a door to the next life. We don't know when that door will open for us, but while we wait, making any kind of comparisons that frustrate you is not helpful. Here's something to think about. Even though we don't know how long our separation is going to be, we do know that when we get to see our children again, we're not going to have to be separated from them a second time like Jacob and Joseph, where Jacob died a few years later. And once we are reunited with all of eternity ahead of us, I am convinced it's going to seem like it was just a nanosecond that we were separated, no matter how many years it was here on this earth. Now, as I was preparing this, I remembered that I had an entry in the Reflections of Hope book, so I looked it up, and this is an entry in August, and it's titled, Goodbye or Hello. I was going to condense part of it and start reading it about halfway through, but I changed my mind. I am going to read it all to wrap up this main segment, and don't fast forward through the resource segment today because I have an announcement you may want to hear. So this is the reading, like I said, that's titled Goodbye or Hello. On October 12, 2011, I was working my way home from a children's ministry conference in North Dakota. Becca was back in the hospital for a routine treatment to take off the extra water weight from her weakening heart. 
While I was away, every day we talked on the phone and she would ask me when I was coming home and I would tell her Wednesday and ask, do you want me to come home early? She would always tell me no. My first flight was late arriving and for the first time ever in many years of travel, both nationally and internationally, my name was being paged in the airport as a final boarding call. So I ran as fast as I possibly could, pulling my carry on wildly behind me through the maze of people walking. And as I turned the corner of my gate, they were starting to close the door and I hollered out to them. And they stopped and they scanned my ticket and down the ramp I went. I was barely able to breathe. And as I started to look at my ticket to see where my seat was, a kind flight attendant told me not to worry about it and to take the empty seat right in front of me. And another one brought me a bottle of water. And my daughter, Kim, picked me up from the airport, and we drove straight to Madison University Hospital, which is where Becca was. There were some unusual things about that visit that, looking back on now, Kim and I were sure Becca was saying goodbye without coming right out and saying that she knew she was leaving us. As I was walking out of her hospital room with plans to return the next morning for her being dismissed, we gave each other the I love you sign, and three hours later, she was gone. I understand there are many of you who don't have this kind of story. You did not get to say goodbye like I did, even though I did not know I was saying a final goodbye at the time. And I am very sorry. I truly am. I hesitated to share this because you know I don't want to bring more pain, frustration, or anger to any of you. But then I realized we will all get to say hello no matter how abrupt their leaving was or how blindsided we were, each one of us will have a joyful reunion someday with our child. I know that does not take away the pain of them not being here with us. I can still cry some heavy tears with pretty good sobs, but I try hard not to wallow in the pain of missing her and instead imagine what it will be like to see Becca again. It isn't always easy to do that, but it is what I aim for. It's natural to spend a lot of time thinking about our child's departure, but that only keeps us in a dark place, being tormented by something that's over and done. We are the ones reliving it in a painful way. Our children certainly are not. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, We may weep through the night, but at daybreak it will turn to shouts of ecstatic joy. I want to encourage you to take a minute and picture your hello. Even if it comes with tears, it is still much better than tormenting yourself with the tears of their departure. Instead, start thinking about the reunion. Ask God to help you make the shift of meditating on the goodbye with darkness and depression to meditating on the hello with excitement and glory. Before I get to the announcement I mentioned, I want to remind you about the GPS Hope and Healing Retreat coming up the end of May in Ohio. This is for only four couples and four moms who would be coming on their own. We like to keep our retreats small and intimate. Two of the rooms for couples have been reserved at this point and one of the beds for the moms is taken. If you are a mom and you want your husband to come but he doesn't like going to things like this, I just want to let you know that 9 out of 10 dads who come to our Hope and Healing Retreats are only there either for their wives or they were dragged by their wives. But 10 out of 10 leave saying how glad they came and that it wasn't anything like they thought it was going to be. We have lots of written testimonies and thank yous from the dads. You can see two of them on the retreat webpage, which is where you can also find all the information and also be able to register and claim your spot. Go to gpshope.org slash retreat, and I will put a link to that in the show notes. Now for the special announcement. You hear me talk about my Reflections of Hope book, which I just read an entry from, right? I know some of you don't want to have a book for an entire year of daily readings, but what about just one month of readings? Is there a month that is especially difficult for you and having some extra encouragement would be helpful? Well, I've got you covered. Starting this coming month, the month of May, 
we are publishing 12 monthly editions of the Reflections of Hope book. You can get just the one or two specific months to get you over the worst times of the year. The May edition of Reflections of Hope, Daily Readings for Bereaved Parents, will be available any day now. So start looking for it on Amazon or wherever you purchase books. One thing I am adding to these monthly editions are weekly discussion questions. So you can get a group together or maybe even just one or two other perievers for those four weeks with each one reading the daily readings on their own and then get together each week to talk about what you read using the questions provided for that week. We're working on getting out June next, which will probably be pretty quick, followed by the rest of the months. All 12 months should be available by the end of May at the latest. Now, we started with May because I know for many of you, Mother's Day and typical events happening this time of year can be brutal. So you might want to consider picking up a copy of the May edition of Reflections of Hope and think about suggesting it to others so you can get together throughout the month and support each other. Even if you don't get a group together when you order your copy, would you please consider sharing that link, the book and where they can get it with others so they can know about it and they can get one for themselves. Let's go ahead with this week's birthday segment. Now I will tell you how to have your child's birthday announced right after I share this week's children. Christopher Schofer was born on April 21st and is forever 25. Shannon Chevalier was born on April 21st and is forever 27. Stephen Francis Reed was born on April 25th, which is also his sunset day when he left this earth and is forever 25. Bradley Brown was born on April 27th and is forever 17. Michael Patnode was born on April 27th and is forever 21. We celebrate the day these children came into the world. We know it will always be a special day. If you would like to have your child's birthday announced the week of his or her birthday, I would love to be able to do that for you. Just go to gpshope.org slash birthdays. Fill out the form, the information there, submit it, and we will add your child to the birthday segment the week of his or her birthday. I am going to randomly share another thing to celebrate. This Sunday, April 28th, Dave and I will be celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary. Yes, we are taking a few days off to spend some time together with just the two of us. 40 years is a long time and worth celebrating, especially with so many deep ups and downs we have been through together. Dave's parents made it for 66 years, so maybe we'll still have another 20 years ourselves. Who knows? He has seen the good, the bad, and the very ugly with me, but he has stuck with me all this time. So I want to say a public happy anniversary to Dave, who's always been the man behind the scenes making me look good for 40 years now. I love you. I want to say thank you again to Jeff and Mary Beth Patnode for sponsoring today's episode in honor of their son, Michael. You can honor your child as well by sponsoring an episode. You can pick the week that has a special meaning to you. You get to write up to 150 words of what you want others to know about your child that I'll read to the listeners, which will be out there for many years as bereavers find the podcast and listen to previous episodes. And this is all for just a $50 tax-deductible donation to GPS Hope. Go to gpshope.org hover over the Donate tab, and click on the Sponsor a Podcast episode, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. As I finish this up, I want to remind you once again not to compare yourself with other perievers in any way. We are all on our own individual and very unique journey. We are all on our own timeline, so don't expect to feel a certain way by a certain time. Very few parents I know have only taken a few months to feel like they want to stay here and continue living out their lives. For most of us, it has easily taken well over a year or more. And I know that may sound horrible, but what I want you to hear is that it did 
happen. The important thing is that even if you don't think it can possibly happen to you, make sure you hang on to those of us who felt the exact same way when our child died, but we are now finding ways to move forward with our lives with meaning and purpose in a way that honors our child. Let us be your hope for you until you have your own hope. And in the meantime, hold on. Pain eases. There is hope.